Welcome to Frauen Adene in Dresden here, Professor Stefan Gunz from Fraunhofer uh, Institute for Solar Energy Systems. Um, I'm very happy that you took all the ways. I think we know each other for more than 15 years now. And I'm happy that we can talk today about research and development in the photovoltaic section. But first of all, you just come from Freiburg today, right? Right, Sebastian. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to Von Adene. And unfortunately, it's on the other side of Germany, so I had to travel quite a way. Yeah? But it was a pleasant journey because I came with the night train and it was a relaxed starting 7 o'clock in the morning here in Dresden Hauptbahnhof. So I took a view to the city, which was nice. Good, good. So um, when we talk about your professional life, I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're working since years in Fraunhofer Ise, but also at the university in Freiburg as a professor. So actually I started in 1988 or 1989 at Fraunhofer Ise, and, and then at that time doing a diploma thesis or now master thesis uh, on solar cells because I was really fascinated by the topic. At that time Fraunhofer Ise was quite a small institute, yeah one of the few doing solar research um, and now everything has changed of course. Front of East is much bigger and we have really something which is like a solar revolution uh, and we have a lot of people working in companies and in solar institutes on that topic. But at that time it was still sort of freaky to do that. Yeah? But I'm super happy that I did it and now for seven years I'm also a professor at university because it's very important for us to get young students into the research as we started, Sebastian also. Yeah? And uh, this is very important for me, so I tr try to push education forward and normally people are then are coming for a master's, uh, master's thesis to front of ESA. Okay, so you brought a nice picture, uh, comparison pictures with us. Uh, yeah. can, can you t talk about that, what we see on the left and what we're seeing on the right side? Yes, so on the left side we see one of the first, let's say, mass production modules. It was not really mass production from Arco Solar in California. And you see these round wafers because at that time silicon was super expensive. So it, they didn't cut away the edges to get rectangular cells. And such a module has, I don't know, like 50 watt peaks uh, output. So it was quite low, 12% efficiency. And um, the good thing is, the good news is more than 30, nearly 40 years later, it's still working. Yeah? So the silicon technology is really something which, which works for a long time. But of course, at that time, it was by far too expensive. And on the right side, you see one of the modern modules, which have typically values, output values of 400 watt peak. Yeah? And you see cells are much bigger, so big that they are cut into two halves now. And we have this rectangular shape and efficiencies are much higher, more than 20% on module uh, level. Okay, so when, when you talk about efficiencies, and I know, uh, Efficiency is, is a big, big part in the photovoltaics industry. Mm -hmm. But for outsiders, it often seems strange, whether it's 22% or 25% in solar cell efficiency. <laughs> That's right. Why is that important? What, what can you explain here? Yeah, okay. So first of all, let's say the conversion efficiencies from light to electricity, that's one of the key figures for photovoltaics. Yeah? If we increase efficiency, that means that we need less materials to create the same amount of energy. Yeah? And that is, of course, saving costs and yeah, pushing up the system level also. So on both sides, we are using less materials. We need less installation and things like that. So it was, over the time, was always the key figure for the industry. Yeah? And of course, cost reduction in production is also very important. We need mass production to do that. And you're right, 20 to 25 doesn't sound like a big difference. But if you look here at the figure, we see that a standard solar cell can reach efficiencies uh, about nine, 29 to 30 percent. Yeah? So comparing 20 of 29 and 25 of 29, this is quite a big difference. And that's why we are pushing hard to get to that limit and improving the cell technology from year to year. So when we see this graph, uh, which you see now in the graph here, I think it started in the 60s, this development. And nowadays we are, as you said, in the 25, 26% region. But maybe you can guide us through the R&D results which you see in the last couple of years. What are the major, let's say, improvements when we talk about silicon uh, solar cell technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, also the, the first real silicon solar cells were created in the early 1950s in the Bell Labs, very famous because they also invented the, the diet, which is of course has changed our life totally. 
And that was all based on silicon and they had efficiencies like 6% in the beginning. And then the first use of solar cells, of course, was space because at that time energy on earth, oil uh, was super uh, low price, so there was not a competition. But in space, we needed the first solar cells and um, they had to be stable, and, uh, but they were not very, let's say, sophisticated from the cell architecture. And the first thing what people have done then was to reduce recombination in cells. What means recombination? So we have light is getting into the solar cell, it's creating free electrons and holes, so negative and positive charge carriers, and we have to get them out. But unfortunately, they can also recombine, so they can destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. And we have to fight against this process. And there are two regions where that can happen in the solar cell or at the surfaces. And the, let's say the first big thing was actually gathering, so get impurities out of the silicon. And then the second thing was to passivate the surface at the front side and then later also on the back side of the solar cell. So this passivated emitter, the emitter is on the front side, the light blue mm -hmm. uh, symbols which you can see here. And that was a layer of, let's say, silicon nitride on the front side, which also helps to get more light in the cell. It's an optical anti-reflection coating. And it reduces the probability that electrons and holes recombine at the front side. That was the first big step forward. And then later on, and that's actually the cell technology which we have right now, um, the PERC cells, um, we have also added such a passivation layer, aluminum oxide, silicon nitride on the rear side and only have local contacts. And that also helped to increase or reduce the recombination, get higher voltage in the solar cell, and also is an internal reflector because, unfortunately, silicon is now number one material. 95% of all solar cells are made from silicon, mm -hmm. but it's not a good light absorber. It's crazy. Huh? But, so we need something at the rear side which is reflecting light back. Yeah? Actually, I remember a young PhD student from ISFH at that time, Sebastian, yeah, giving a talk on such layers uh, in our workshop. Yeah. And this was sort of a breakthrough, this PERC cell. But as you can see from the graph, that was already invented in the 1980s or so. Mm -hmm. And it took more than 20, 25 years to bring that into industry. Yeah. But these cycles of innovations are getting faster and faster. No, we are so not do I understand that the uh, circular uh, and uh, triangles are R&D values? Good. And on the right-hand side, I do see the production numbers. Exactly. Is this right? Genau. So that is, a, let's say, a typical path of production, which is actually coming from real data. So we see this light blue cell, which is also known as aluminum BSF cell. And that for a long time was the number one working horse of the industry. And with that, they could improve efficiency by 0.5 to 0.6 percent absolute every year. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that is very important uh, that we have this path. But then, around 20 percent, they saw, oh, it's not going on. Yeah, and then they look to the papers which R&D has written already 20 years ago. Yeah, and say, ah, there's a new cell structure which is the Perk cell. How can we bring it in, into industry? And of course. If you have done something in the lab, it doesn't mean at all that you can do it immediately in the industrial production. So it needs machines to do that, processes, and they have to be developed. And that was then done. And um, now we have this perk structure and we can go up to efficiencies around 24%. Depends a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and when you talk about perk, you have the preservation front side, yeah. rear side. But you, you hear, when you see here passivating contacts, that's an, an additional topic. Why, yeah, no. why do you need passivating contacts? So now we have, let's say, covered nearly the whole surface on the front side and the rear side with this very good surface passivation layer. But what's left over are the contacts. Mm -hmm. yeah? And metal contacts, we need them, of course. Otherwise, we cannot get the electrons and holes out of the solar cell. But we also have a lot of recombination at that point. And the trick for the perk cell was to reduce the area of the metal contacts. And now that, you know, it came to a limit to like 24 to 25%. And now we want to get even this point where we have the metal contacts better. And this is called passivating contacts. Ah, okay, understood. So is it many customers who produce now PERC technology going yeah. to Topcon? Yeah. I think Topcon is something what you and your team yes, exactly. worked on, right? Yeah, yeah. So there were parallel activities also at your former institute, uh, Sebastian ISFH. And this Topcon term was coming really from Fraunhofer ESE. And it's, it's a layer of a very thin silicon dioxide and uh, highly doped polysilicon. 
-hmm. And the trick is that this layer of silicon dioxide is so thin that the electrons can tunnel through. That's why it's tunnel oxide. Yeah? And it also gives a good surface passivation. So we have a good conductivity for electrons, but only for electrons, while the holes are blocked because we have a highly doped n-type layer, for example. We can also do the other way around. And then we have the metal. Mm -hmm. And then the metal is sort of screened. Yeah? It's not doing creating a recombination in the cell. Okay, so this is passivating context top con. Like if you have a perk technology and you just switch maybe two, three process steps and then you have top con, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. Um, but people talking also about heterojunction technology. So especially newcomers who think about investing in new production facilities nowadays talking about heterojunction. So what, what is the difference between top con and heterojunction? I say the, the basic idea is in principle the same, but the layer structure is a little bit different. So TopCon is a thin silicon dioxide and a heavily doped polysilicon. And in heterojunction, we have actually it's hetero. So we have amorphous silicon, a thin layer, intrinsic amorphous silicon, and then a doped amorphous silicon layer. And that is a structure which is also already there, I don't know, for 20 years or more. Yeah? And it's giving very high voltages in the solar cell. So the surface passivation is excellent. Yeah? And it's a little bit different to the, let's say, conventional PERC or PERC TopCon cells because you're not doing any diffusion anymore. So normally this emitter with the PN junction is diffused by boron or phosphorus diffusion. And in that case, we only use the layers. Yeah? So it's a low temperature process because it's a So you save energy. You save energy yeah. in the process. Yeah. You can do all the processes in principle in one long machine. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, let's say, different approach to pro uh, process solar cells. And when we talk about long term, is, is there any beneficial effects from heterojunction versus topcon? Or how yeah, do you see I that? would say the, the advantage of heterojunction right now is that they can achieve higher voltages. So let's say for if you think one step further um, into, let's say, tandem solar cells, yeah, then heterojunction makes a lot of sense and because they have very high voltages. And they, they are, let's say, the advantage of TopCon right now is that it's a high temperature process which is more compatible with uh, metal uh, uh, because for that you also need high temperature processing later on, yeah. okay. metallization. So um, you brought with you also a yeah. fun, funny comic uh, with you, and I see it here on the screen. Um, it's, it's a leaking water bucket. So yeah. um, what does it have with, with research in, in solar cells? What, where are the parallelities here? Yeah. So I, I use this, uh, this graph in, in my lecture. Yeah? It's a leaky bucket. The idea is much older. It's from Dick Swanson and Richard Swartz, really two of the pioneers of silicon photovoltaics. Um, you can imagine a solar cell as a bucket. We want to have as much water as possible in the bucket. Yeah? But unfortunately, it's not a perfect bucket. It has some holes. Yeah? So the water is running out. Yeah? And what we have to do is we have to fix these holes, uh, shown here by the plasters. So for example, the surface passivation this fix is already fixed, sort of. But as we just discussed, for example, the contact recombination here on the left side, it's still open. And the water is still running out. And the funny thing, or the interesting thing is, if we fix one of the holes, the water level is increasing in the bucket and the pressure of the, on the remaining holes is getting higher. Yeah? So the hole has the same diameter, but there's more water running out. And that means for us, the closer we get to this theoretical limit, the harder it is to fix all the bucket. In the beginning, it's easy. You have big holes, you just make a plaster on it and you, it's, it's perfect. But now the water level is rising and rising. Yeah? And so for the last steps, it will be harder to reach higher efficiencies. And that's why we think you, that 27% is maybe, or 26.5% is the limit for this, the technical limit of silicon solar cells. The theoretical one is 29.4%. Okay, okay. So, but that's actually what your teams in, at Fraunhofer ISE are continuously working it to, we are to fixing, fix this We bucket. are fixing the bucket. That's all we do. Yeah? Uh, that you have to simple. study. Yeah, that's, that's that how simple. simple. Yeah. We get some money for fixing a bucket. Yeah. That's cool. So um, maybe going on, on, on another level. So talking about photovoltaics as a whole industry. Last year, everybody knows we reached the terawatt age. So yes. basically, all together, PV models installed worldwide is more than 1,000 uh, gigawatt now. Europe alone has the idea to go to one terawatt in 2030. So there's a lot of movement here. 
and this requires also a vast amount of resources. Yeah. Um, so where do you see here the biggest challenges and yeah. uh, how to, come, to overcome these challenges? Yeah. You know, this one terawatt was a big milestone and when I started 30 years ago, that was a number, you know, far away. Yeah? If you would have said that 30 years ago, everybody said, yes, yes, yeah, one terawatt. And now it's here, but we are still in the beginning of the solar revolution. If you really want to change the problems or help with the problems of climate change and things like that, yeah, then we have to go to 60 terawatts and more in 2050. So for all the young people outside there, this uh, solar revolution has just begun. Now things are really happening in, in, in big scale. And for that, for this step, efficiency again is super important because now we, in the beginning, in the last 20 years, the main thing was to reduce costs. Yeah, because PV was by far too expensive. So reaching levels below one euro watt uh, per watt peak that was a big number. It's done. It's, but we still have to go further because now we have to use enormous amounts of materials, silicon, silver and things like that. And the better the efficiency, the less materials we need and the more sustainable solar cells are. Because in the production, solar cells also need some energy, they need materials. And we have to make this process better and better, especially if you think about the 60 terawatt. Okay. And when you, when you say, um, talking about the 60 gigawatt, also I think the important thing is the R&D community to work on this. So uh, can you give maybe one or two examples where you and your teams are currently working on specifically? Yeah. So in, on top of you know, this increase of efficiency, one interesting thing is the silver. Because the sil silver is used as a front side contact of solar cells. Yeah? And these people developing the screen print process, they were super successful to reduce the contact step by step. That brings two advantages. The efficiency is going up because the contacts are getting narrower. And we are losing, using less silver. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But still, they need some silver. And now we have to multiply everything with 60 or more. And then you see that the amount of silver which we need for PV is really a huge amount compared to all the other industries or jewelry um, where also silver is needed. So we have to think about it, is that really possible or do we run into a shortage of silver at the point? And we think a good possibility would be copper. Mm -hmm. uh, copper has the same, nearly the same conductivity as silver, it's cheaper and it's more, more available than silver. And things like this didn't play a big role 20 years ago yeah, because efficiency was number one. And that is now very important. Okay, thanks. And um, when I understand when you talk about efficiency, you uh, told me also um, in the preliminary talk that um, when, when you were young, people come to you and said, hey, come on, silicon, this is not the future. We're talking about other technologies. Yes, yes. And, and nowadays it seems, but really to be the case that silicon is not the only thing. You need additional materials to come to higher efficiencies. You talked already before about tandem. Can you, can you explain where it's coming from? Yeah, of course, you know, over the time, there were a lot of competitors to, to silicon photovoltaics and they're still existing, you know, like thin film technologies like cadmium telluride or CIGS, yeah. But also other things which are not existing so much anymore. But it's good to have competition uh, over the years. And um, I think the advantage of silicon was all the time that so many people have worked on crystalline silicon. Mm -hmm. yeah? So this, this scale, uh, scaling up, that was really the trick. And as we have seen, the problem now for silicon is that this increase of 0.5 to 0.6% efficiency will only last for the next three, four, five years. Yeah? And then um, we'll come to the limit. And then we can say, okay, we stop now, but it will not happen. I'm totally convinced about that. So industry has to, or the whole community has to find a way to overcome this limit of 29%. And these are tandem cells. Mm -hmm. And tandem cell is not a new invention. If you go to space, all the spacecrafts and satellites, they are already tandem triple, quadruple cells for ages. Yeah? But of course, the cost structure in space is a little bit different to Earth. Yeah? So they can afford more expensive solar cells. And um, now we want to do it on Earth again also. And as an old silicon guy, I'm saying we are starting with silicon and we are putting something on top. Yeah? You put something on top. So why do you put something on top? Yeah. So Sebastian, our problem is that the sun is not monochromatic. So it's not red or yellow or whatever. It's, 
it's a wide band width. We all know the, the nice rainbow, so we have to cover all the different colors. And um, one solar cell can only deal with one wavelength perfectly. That's shown here in this graph. And um, you see, so for example, a silicon solar cell um, can use the spectrum of the sun, which is here in gray. Yeah? It's a normalized spectrum, which we have, for example, in Germany on a sunny day. And the solar cell, the silicon solar cell, can only use the red part because um, it has a, a band gap, an energy band gap. And that is, let's say, we have to lift the electrons from the valence band, which is in the bottom here, to the conduction band over the band gap. And if we have photons which have two less energy, so on the right side, high wavelengths, infrared, yeah, they cannot do it. So they are all lost. Yeah? Then we have one wavelength in silicon, it's around 1100 nanometers which is doing the job perfectly. So we can use all the energy of the photon. And then we have blue photons, which have a lot of power, yeah? mm -hmm. ultraviolet and blue, and they have too much energy. So we cannot use the complete energy. We can use the photon, but not the complete energy in the photon. And that's why we have to do something on that. And the trick is that we use two solar cells on top of each other. That's a tandem cell. Mm -hmm. So the new one here is shown in blue. And it has a wider band gap. So it can use the blue photons in a better way, um, while the red photons um, are still used by the bottom cell, so that would be silicon again. And then we see on the right side that the spectrum, the gray spectrum, is now much better utilized than before, and that means higher efficiency. And then we can go beyond 30%. Okay, so the, the, the higher uh, the, the area which is covered, the higher the exactly. solar cell efficiency. Exactly. So in principle, which is not theoretically not possible, it would be nice to cover the whole gray area. But we try to get closer to that. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to have two or three or more solar cells with different uh, band gaps. So this energy band gaps and then it can be done. Okay. So um, th that sounds very nice in theory. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I, right. I like this graph. It's it's nice, but how does it really look in practice? So how can I imagine such a tandem solar cell structure? Um, how does it work in in real? Yeah. So as as we know, silicon it's well known, but we have to work on this top level. And as I'm coming from Freiburg, which is close to the Black Forest, as everybody knows, yeah, I always try to compare it with a cake. Yeah. Okay. So a silicon solar cell is, is like a nice chocolate cake. Yeah. It's nice. It's working very well, it, but it's sort of boring somehow. Yeah. <laughs> and now what the Black Forest people do with such a, a biscuit chocolate cake is they cut it into layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they fill it with cream and some alcohol. Yeah. And cherries. And that's a famous uh, Black Black Forest cherry cake. Yeah. And it has actually some. Uh, analogies to a, a tandem cell because it also has different layers. Of course, it's just a joke, yeah. Um, but it's it's the same idea. So we need new layers which you have to put uh, to put on top of the silicon solar cell. And one possibility is shown in the next graph, um, and that is perovskite. This is now I would call the new superstar, the new kid on the block. You, you can read it everywhere, right? Yeah, you Perovskite, can read it. Uh, perovskite is everywhere. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's about like say like five to ten years, it's really uh, one of the new materials and it has one huge advantage compared to silicon, actually two. You can change a band gap. Silicon is silicon is silicon, yeah? Mm -hmm. But with the perovskite, you can change the composition of that material because it consists of different atoms, yeah? And by changing the composition ratio, you can change a band gap. What and we exactly need. Exactly. Okay. So we need something which is, has a higher band gap and you can play around with, with the perovskite and then have something which fits perfectly to the silicon cell. And the second big advantage actually, it's much better in light absorption, much better than silicon. Yeah? So we need only a very narrow layer. So silicon typically is 200 micrometers around that uh, thickness, mm -hmm. so 0 0.2 millimeters. And the perovskite solar cell only has 200 nanometers. So it's a factor of 1,000 less, but it also does a job of light absorption very good. Wow. So, so that's cool. Wow, that's impressive. So um, w when we talk about this structure, so um, what kind of efficiencies can you achieve today? Is it already on top of yeah, uh, yeah. silicon? So that's, that's pretty cool. So um, as I said, this, the theoretical efficiency of silicon is 29.4%. Yeah? And with this structure, so 
groups have now achieved more than 30%, 32%. Yeah? And um, w the first time when we had a higher efficiency than this theoretical limit of the silicon solar cell, that was really a perfect day because it showed that we, we can really do it. It's not only theory. The only problem, it was done in lab scale. Yeah? So right now what we have to do is, this is not a real product right now, but it can be in the future. It's shown in the lab that it could work, mm -hmm. but we need processes for high throughput and we need stability for 30 exactly. years. Exactly, that's, that's my point. When, when we have customers, they also want to know on the timeline when, yeah. when we can buy tandem products. But before coming to this, mm -hmm. we have to solve uh, some issues, right? So the, you, you mentioned that 32.5% uh, efficiency, yeah. Yeah. which is right now the world record, yeah. I think, from Helmholtz Centrum in, in Berlin. Berlin, exactly. Um, so when I understand, it's a really small area when, when they achieve this efficiency. So scaling is for sure one uh, topic, right? Yeah. But, but what are the other two, three uh, topics where you and your teams and all the teams around the world working on to get to the high efficiencies, not in, in R&D, but in pilot and then at the end also in mass production. Yeah, yeah. So we have to make this perovskite silicon tandem cells a working horse like a standard silicon cell. Yeah? So it has to work on large areas. So as I said, typical lab cells are in the range of one square centimeter or so. Yeah? So we have to scale it up. And if you look at all the record values, there are a lot of groups are working on these small cells, but only a few are working on cell areas beyond 100 square centimeter. And that has to be changed now. So we have to go up with the maturity. Another thing is process reproducibility. <laughs> Sorry for that. And uh, so in silicon, you have really a narrow distribution of your efficiencies, which is coming out. Mm -hmm. This is not the case for the lab cells at all. Yeah? So we have to work on the process uh, reliability. And I think one of the big issues is also um, long-term stability. I've shown this Arco solar module, I know more than 40 years old, still working. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this perosilicon tunnels has also have to work for more than 25 years. And um, silicon is really a super stable material. So we are sure about that. The perovskites have a little bit different uh, composition. Yeah? They can change their, their, um, their morphology a little bit. And that's why we have to work on that topic. Yeah? Okay. So there's iron migration, for example, sometimes in the cells. Mm -hmm. But they're, every year they're really getting better. Not only the efficiency is getting better, but also um, the degradation behavior is getting less and less. Yeah? Okay. Uh, it, it sounds like a super... Uh, uh, nice field for R&D people, exactly. when you say you can talk, vary the composition, you can change the technology, you can change the process flow. I think it's, it sounds like a good time uh, yeah. to, to do R&D again. It's super nice. Yeah. So, but when it comes to um, uh, your opinion, when do you think I can buy a tandem module which is produced on, on a large scale? Can you, can you give me a... I'm a little bit cautious, I'm a little bit cautious about <laughs> that because one thing which I learned in the last 30 years, everything takes longer than expected. Yeah? That's a golden rule. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And of course, as you have seen, in five years or so, we will reach this limit in industry. And I think the pressure is increasing and increasing in industry that they have to have a new generation, a new product for the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, that's why I think something between five to ten years, that is a real product. Yeah? But some issues have to be solved. Okay, nice. So you, you mentioned before you can vary the uh, band gap yeah. uh, uh, in, in the perovskite. So why do you use just one uh, perovskite? Can you use multiple layers in order to increase the efficiency even further? Good question. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's actually it's a good idea. So tandem, let's say with, with two materials, yeah, this is just the beginning. Yeah, and if you have then three or four, yeah we can even go to higher efficiencies. That's what the space guys and the concentrator photovoltaic in 3.5 have done. And um, the question is, what is, let's say, the best balance between process complexity and efficiency? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we think that triple solar cells might be the optimum between these two uh, uh, things. And um, so we have already done such triple cells on silicon with 3.5 materials, because 3.5, gallium, arsenide-based materials, are these space materials or concentrator materials, and we have achieved an efficiency, one step further, <laughs> uh, of 35.9%. So that's the that's world record for this silicon-based uh, tandem cells. 
the, the issue here with gallium arsenide based materials, they are, they are very stable, the process is very reliable, but they are more expensive than perovskites. So, ah, we want to so do you want to change exactly. from gallium arsenide more to we want to do, We want to do both. Yeah, we have to make this cheaper, the gallium mm -hmm. arsenide, or we have to make pero pero silicon tandem. And we have already done the first cells at front of ESA, work very nice, and we are not, you know, the efficiency right now is not higher uh, than the one of the standard tandem cells, but we are getting closer to that. And there's a lot of push, you know, all these PhD students, they want to have the highest efficiency, so we like that. Uh, that's, that's really good. So, and, and I, I, I feel your passion about, mm. about this and making efficient, more efficient solar cells. So, um, Stefan, you're, I know you as an excellent researcher and you get all the awards from ENI, you get the Becquerel Prize also for your outstanding achievement in photovoltaics. Um, but I know you also as a dedicated promoter of young mm. students, right? So I think 15 years ago, I think something like this, you started uh, also in, in a silicon uh, uh, or a silicon forest workshop where exactly. people, PhDs, started from all over Germany come and talk about the newest development in silicon, and I was one of them the back, back, back at this time. Yeah. But now there's also from Europe, so like like Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, they also come around and have a good atmosphere and you create basically the atmosphere that the young students can, can work there. So, so I think in these days where we talk about the shortage of skilled workers, this is a very important thing. So, so what do you see to say to young uh, women and men who, who, want, who do not know what they do and what they want to do, and, but who consider to start a career in the renewables, act, uh, actually? What do, what do you say to them? Uh, yeah, I, as I said, the solar revolution has just begun. Yeah? So many things to be done, new cell generations coming up. And the good thing, Sebastian, is compared to other fields in technology, it's easy for us to find people who would like to do the master thesis or PhD thesis because they are really motivated to do something in technology to help on our you know, big challenges like the climate change and things like that. Yeah? And this is super easy. And of course, you have to bring this group together. That's why we have this workshop, because I'm a strong believer that it's not only information exchange. You know, you have to discuss. And maybe the most important machine in every institute is a coffee machine at the end, <laughs> yeah? because people meet there. And that's why I was not so super happy with all this Corona stuff yeah, because a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting is good to exchange information, but it's not good, good for this informational information. And that's why we do we are going on with these workshops. So the Silicon Forest, as you have mentioned, that was starting when the big time in Silicon, when the perk cell was coming into industry and things like that. And now we are changing actually to tandem cells yeah, because you know, people are now, also Silicon people are also fascinated by the topic and new students are coming in and we have a group at ESA and they are super enthusiastic about that. And, you know, that keeps me young. I'm an old guy, yeah? but uh, working with all this uh, young women and men on, on photovoltaics technology, this is really what keeps me alive. Okay. Thanks, Stefan. It was really a pleasure to talk to, with you about the R&D in photovoltaics. Thanks for taking the way and see you soon. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you.